feels good on your bare feet on the carpet. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci once worked on a great masterpiece for a very long time, and there was a young student who was watching him work. The student watched as the painting evolved and everything in front of him was coming into place. And he was so awed by da Vinci's technique that he was hoping to observe and pick up some of da Vinci's techniques so that he himself perhaps could paint as well. Well, just before finishing the painting, da Vinci turned to the student and he gave him his paintbrush. And he said, now, you finish it. Well, the student looked at da Vinci and said, no, I, I could never, ever do something like this. I couldn't dream of finishing the master's work. But da Vinci said to him, if what I have done has not inspired you to do your best, what good is it that you observed me in the first place? As we read through the Bible, we can sense the work of a master. We can see Jesus in every book of scripture. It all points to that. As we can see the message of, of Christ's coming in every stroke of the brush through the scriptures. Throughout the Old Testament, we hear it. He is coming. He is coming. And in the Gospels, we read that someone has come. Someone has come. And in the remainder of the New Testament, we hear not only somebody has not only come, but that he is coming again. And throughout the scriptures, we get this impression that God has created a great masterpiece. And then, almost like a still, small voice in the back of our minds, we sense that God has, in a manner of speaking, stepped back and handed us the brush, saying, finish this for me. Now, by now, you've figured out that Eric and I really like to preach and teach about evangelism and about mission. We believe, though, that every one of us is called to be a preacher. That's right, you heard me right. I believe, and Eric believes, that every single one of you out there is called to be a preacher. Only some of us have to use words to do it. Others do not. You see, everyone, there in their, every Christian, is supposed to be a reflection of Jesus Christ himself. And that includes the way that we say things, the way that we think, the things that we do, and how we live. It's all part of evangelism. Now, too many times we seem quite reluctant to tell other people about Jesus Christ. We seem to think that as long as we go to church on Sundays, we can pretty much live our lives the way we want to the rest of the week. But you know, we're supposed to go out and talk to others about salvation about Jesus Christ. We cannot afford to fall into the trap of thinking that, as long, that we can receive Jesus as our Savior and then keep him our private little secret for the rest of the time. Let's look again at Romans 10, 14. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? So in other words, Paul is asking people how people can come to know Christ if we don't tell them. Now I'll be perfectly here, honest here and, and say that I often wonder what in the world God was thinking when he assigned us the task of sharing the good news. Really, what was he thinking? Surely there has to be more effective ways of getting the message of salvation across to others. I mean, the angels him, themselves had to have been wondering what he was thinking. Now, the plan for God to come to earth as a human being, the person of Jesus Christ, was, it was ingenious. It truly was. He only a human could represent humanity and bear the punishment that we deserve. Yet God also overcame death. But to leave the responsibility of spreading the news in the hands of feeble, fickle humanity, it's just baffling to me. Joe Aldrich began his book, Lifestyle Evangelism, with an imaginative fable. He says that the angel Gabriel approached Jesus and said, Master, you must have suffered terribly for men down there. I did, Jesus replied. Then Gabriel continued, do they know all about how you love them and what you did for them? 
Oh no, said Jesus, not yet. Right now only a handful of people know. A few people in Palestine. So Gabriel was perplexed. Then what have you done, he asked, to let everyone know about your great love for them? And Jesus said, I've got Peter and James and John and a few more friends, getting them to tell other people about me. Those who are told will in turn tell others about me, and my story will be spread to the farthest reaches of the globe. Ultimately, all of mankind will have heard my, about my life and what I have done. Now, Gabriel frowned, and he looked rather skepti skeptical because he knew the stuff that men was made of. Yes, he said, but what if Peter and James and John grow weary? What if people who come after them forget? What if way down in the 21st century, people just don't tell others about you? Have you made any other plans? And Jesus answered, I haven't made any other plans. I'm counting on them. So how are we doing? How are we doing in what Jesus expects of us? Have you talked about anyone? Uh, talked to Jesus about anyone in the recent past? Invited anyone to church lately? I know some have. Paul says that the only way we can know about Jesus if so, is if someone tells us. What are we telling them? Now before we get all intimidated and frightened ourselves out of doing his work, let me make two things very, very clear. First, God believes in us. If he didn't, he would have never given us the brush to complete his masterpiece. See, he believes we can tell others the good news, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Now he's not asking you to go out and recite the Bible. He is not asking you to get into some big, great theological discussion with someone else about Christianity. All he wants you to do is tell others what Jesus has done for you. Now, the second thing we need to remember about telling others the good news is that God gives us all the help we need. In Romans 8, 27, it tells us that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us according to God's will. So if it's God's will that we're supposed to share the good news with other people, then it is God's promise that he will send us the Holy Spirit to help us do it. Acts 1.8 But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power and will tell people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So even though God gives us this responsibility of spreading the gospel, he also tells us we don't have to do it alone. He does not expect us to do it by ourselves. He indeed sends his Holy Spirit to help us. Okay, now by this time, a bunch of you are sitting there with a whole bunch of excuses in your mind as to why you couldn't possibly talk to anyone else about your faith. You know, in our society today, there is so much talk about tolerance that sometimes I think we're afraid to speak our faith for fear of offending others. But when a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon comes to my door and shares their faith with me, I'm not offended. And when I share my faith in a conversation right back with them, they are not offended either. And if the plain gospel is offensive to someone, then there's nothing we can do about it. See, the fact is, sometimes, for some, the truth hurts. We still must share the gospel with people. What is truly offensive, what is truly offensive, is to not share the gospel message with others. Now here I, I have to mention what we should not do, though. Like some people I've known, we should not intentionally try to offend another person. When we are communicating the gospel, we must be sensitive to others. 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16, And if you are asked about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But you must do this in a gentle and respectful way. So we need to remember that our goal in sharing the good news is to bring people into a relationship with God. And we must do our best to be gentle and respectful. Now if the message itself offends, there isn't anything we can do about it. But we must be careful that it is not the way we present the message 
that offends. Now, I suspect that another reason some of you may be thinking you cannot possibly share your faith is you think you are not knowledgeable enough about Christianity to do it. You say that you wouldn't know how to approach it, approach it in our culture, but in our culture, we have programs for everything. You know, we have actually hundreds of courses that can teach us about sharing our faith. And if you have these tools, they're really nice, wonderful tools, but they are not necessary. They are not essential. Think about the original disciples. Did they pick up a book and have a Bible study on how to share your faith? No. They were a bunch of uneducated fishermen and tax collectors, basically just normal people. And they weren't coming up with super theological ideas either. They were merely telling a story. They were telling other people about their experiences with Jesus and what he had done for them. Didn't need a great education to do that. In fact, normal people are more willing to accept the message from other normal people. Now, when people hear Eric and I share the good news, they say, well, that's what they're supposed to do. They get paid to do that. But when the good news of Jesus Christ is shared from a person who's just like them, maybe you and you and you and you and you, that's when they'll hear the message. They say, wow, that worked for them and it can work for me too. Now, if you are a believer, God has done something incredible for you. He has changed your life. And when you tell your friends or your coworkers or your family members about what God has done, it's, it's hard for them to ignore. You see, they can truly see the change in your life. They can see that you no longer do the things you used to do, and they can see that you have joy and peace, even when the situations around you are bad. They can see the power of God at work in your life. And when they see, have seen all that God has done for you, they may not even know it was God. But when you tell them it was God through Jesus Christ that did all this for you, they too can believe in him. And they can believe because they've already seen it work in you. Final line of our scripture reading today, which I shared with the children. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is what the scriptures mean when they say how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Let me ask you a question. How many of you think of your feet as being beautiful? I think not many of us really look at our feet and think about that. We Most of us don't think we have beautiful feet, but God does. When you tell others about Jesus, God thinks your feet are absolutely beautiful. Notice it doesn't say how beautiful are the hands that hand out tracks or how beautiful is the email that you forward to a friend. And God does not say how beautiful is the door hanger that you leave on somebody's doorknob. And granted, those are all good things. I love getting emails. Don't stop sending them just because I said that. Y'all send me the emails. All good things. But when you actually get up on your feet, go out and start making disciples, it is your feet that carry you there to do so. And that's why God says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Now, every one of us in this room is called to come together here today for, for worship, to be here together. All of us in this room at the end will be sent out from this place back into the world to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ and oh, God's wonderful love. Now over the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking more about that and more about inviting others to come to church. On September 15th, we will have our national Back to Church Day. This will be happening all across the nation. How many churches are involved now? A couple of thousand? How many? Over 20,000 churches now have taken part of Back to Church Sunday. Our worship on service on that day is going to have a few little extra touches, and we are going to have a covered dish 
And yes, so that's our family fellowship supper for next month, but it's after church, not in the evening. We will do it immediately after church and covered dish like you normally do stuff. Now your job, besides making your wonderful food that has made me the shape I am today, <laughs> your job is to invite people to come on that Sunday as our guests to come and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So if you don't feel comfortable enough going out there and telling something, all you got to do is invite them to church. That's it. We'll tell them. Get them here. That's your assignment. That's your job. Invite people. And invite them. They don't have to bring supper. Y'all, we're, we're feeding them. Y'all, we're going to be. So they don't bring their lunch. There are guests on that day for lunch. You know, invite them to come and join this, this fellowship and this family that we call Westminster. Folks, pick up your paintbrush. You got a masterpiece to finish. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This week we start a new creed. We'll invite you to stand. This creed